according to the cloud, if you could. Well, hello, uh, I'm James Stoner, director of the Eric Vogel Institute at Louisiana State University. And it's my privilege to welcome you to the second of our five part series on the theme, who was Eric Vogelin and what did he think? Um, uh, Vogelin taught at LSU for about 15 years uh, and uh, uh, published there some of the works we'll be talking about today, including the new, uh, published here, uh, The New Science of Politics. Uh, we're very honored to have as our guest this week, uh, Dr. Lee Trepanier, who teaches now at Samford University. He's a graduate of our program, actually, studied with Dr. Um, Ellis Sandoz. Uh, he's the author um, uh, and editor of many, many books, and I think it's up to two dozen at least, but, uh, but uh, I lose every time I write it down. Uh, he's got another one that's come out. Um, many of them related in some way or another to Vogelin's work. Um, uh, he's taught as well in um, Utah and in uh, Michigan and moved a couple years ago to Samford in Alabama. Uh, our topic today is Vogelin on politics. And uh, uh, Lee, welcome. And uh, let me start with this question. We talked last time with Barry Cooper about Vo sort of the whole range of Vogelin's intellectual biography and his thought. And we certainly could see that Vogelin was interested in many, many things, uh, things from antiquity, things that concern theology and art and the like. And yet he was a student of politics as well. And uh, his first book that in, in uh, the United States that sort of built his reputation here was called The New Science of Politics. And he taught in a political science department, I guess it was called government at the time here at LSU when he was here. And in some ways the concerns of politics are never too far from what he writes, doesn't he? So how is it that Vogelin is a political scientist? Uh, and I guess that's sort of a double-edged question. Um, how is politics central to what he does? And how is what he does political science in relation to uh, what say your colleagues and my colleagues and the colleagues or many of the colleagues of many of us uh, who are political scientists study today? Uh, well, well, thanks for the softball question. Um, but no, thank you for <laughs> thank you for the invitation here, and thank you for everyone showing up to this. I think, um, with regards to Vogelin as a political scientist, um, it's, it's pretty clear that if you read the autobiographical reflections that his time in, in Austria um, and, and his experience with anti-Semitism and Nazism had a profound effect on him existentially and professionally leaving Europe to the United States. So that's always sort of been sort of an existential motivation uh, for that, that where politics is at the forefront of his sort of intellectual concerns. Um, I mean, he even states at points where um, he, he sees that uh, sort of is a uh, aversion to violence and sort of being uh, being committed to sort of intellectual inquiry and honesty um, makes makes him want to sort of recover reality as it's properly understood for him. And to recover reality, um, it doesn't, it's not just a singular task, but it's a societal task. And um, so if you look at, for example, uh, Hitler and the Germans, well, which he published later, right? He, he looks at sort of the institutions of Germany at that time the churches, the laws, um, the, um, the universities, it's also being sort of corrupt and, and had a uh, detrimental influence and in, in deforming reality. And so he sees the, if the purpose of political science, uh, purpose of political scientists is to recover reality, it's a joint effort, it's a societal effort. One person just can't do it by himself. So I think that's why you could see him as a political scientist and not as a philosopher per se. Um, regarding to the question of why, what is political science for him, or you know, the book that made his name in, in America, the New Science of Politics, it's in it, it's um, it's in reaction to uh, the movement of behavioralism. He's responding directly to that movement in the, in the United States, which is behavioralism, really started in the twenties and um, really from the twenties to the sixties, and be, the behavioral movement basically looked at how can we sort of quantify political behavior? How can we explain and predict it? 
and how can we do it in an objective or value-free way? And so his new science of politics is a, is an, a response to the, sort of the, the, the trend in American political science uh, to that. Is this the same thing, this behaviorism that he calls positivism or does positivism have a more extensive history or how are the two related? Because- Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would science talk about yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think you know, positive is more of a sort of a longer philosophical uh, doctrine, you know, from the 18th to the 20th century. And behavioralism is sort of one of the manifestations of positive philosophy. But as he points out in, in the reader, his criticism of positivism are really threefold. First, he he thinks that um, positivists claim that the natural sciences is sort of the model for all types of knowledge. Um, and he thinks that's not true. And then secondly, the second criticism of positivism is that the positivist method or the, the scientific method is the only way that knowledge can be produced. Um, and so um, we, so the method is more important than the actual subject of study. And so if anyone's read um, some of the top journals in the social sciences, I won't name them. <laughs> yeah, it's all sort of methodological questions that um, yeah, may be interesting to a few people, but you know, if those who are sort of interested in the subject of politics, those, those articles aren't gonna be of any interest to that person. And the third criticism he has against positivism is that it claims to be objective or value-free. So um, he's reacting to, um, those are sort of his three criticisms of positivism. Um, you know, the science is, is the model for all knowledge. Um, the scientific method is the only way that yield genuine knowledge and that it's value-free or objective. Um, and so behavioralism is sort of a manifestation that he's sort of, I, th I think, responding to in, in the moment in, in, in the 1950s. Well, so then what does he put in its place, right? I mean, so if, if natural science isn't the only model, is there some other, uh, some other science or some other study that can help guide political science? Uh, um, what is the place for the study? I mean, surely he allows us to study voting behavior and public opinion, doesn't he? And, and uh, what is the place for that? How does that uh, fit into everything else? And then this objectivity, what is, what's the alternative? Why isn't uh, the scientific ob objective? It certainly is when we're talking about physics, doesn't it? I mean, isn't it? I mean, we don't talk about, I don't have a personal physics as opposed to somebody else's physics, but, uh, but why, would, why would political science, is he saying that just behavioral political science isn't really objective or that no political science is objective or can be? Well, yeah, I, I think one way to approach that question is that, yes, I mean, what, what behavioralism is useful uh, and can yield knowledge, but it, for him, it doesn't yield sort of the fundamentals of political reality. Um, so, it, you know, in, in the reader, uh, he makes a distinction between sort of elemental representation and existential representation. Um, so, elemental is sort of dealing with sort of political behavior, things we can look at, but existential representation or things of questions of um, order, disorder, or morality is what he's interested in. Or maybe to put it another way, uh, his, his new science of politics is based on sort of Platonic Aristotelian roots, uh, where if you recall from Aristotle, um, you know, you use the right method for the right object. You don't use one method to study everything. And so that, that's what Vogelin is, is sort of employing in the new science of politics. He says, you know, it's questions of, of transcendence or questions of experience of order and disorder can't be understood through these behavioralist or positivist methods. And so what he does instead, he creates um, sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, sort of a, a science of political symbols to, to sort of get, get at the experience of order and disorder. And, um, and, and so to understand that, or to, he thinks that's more fundamental, a more fundamental analysis of politics than what you would find in behavioralism. And can you give us some examples of what are the, when he says political symbols, what does he mean by political symbols? What are the symbols of, uh, of political life? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So uh, I think generally speaking, political symbols for Vogelin are really sort of um, 
a society self-interpretation of a transcendent truth or transcendent reality in that way. So political symbols are, they emerge, they don't emerge arbitrarily, but they emerge with um, a person or society's engagement with reality in, in all levels of beings from inorganic reality to transcendent reality. And so he provides um, in his, in his work, early works, he provides sort of three classifications of symbols, um, uh, cosmological symbols, anthropological, and sot soteriological. So the co cosmological symbol is where society sees itself as representing sort of the, a mirror image of the cosmos, sort of the natural rhythms of the seasons and the cycles of the stars and the moons. And anthropological symbolization is really sort of philosophical, more accented on, on the um, life of reason. And sociological is, is more on accent on, on revelation. So um, I think one thing to mention maybe is that symbols are different from, for Vogel and symbols are different than ideas. Um, so when, he, I know Barry talked about it last week, you know, he's, before he wrote Order in History, he did an eight volume study of, on the history of political ideas. And, and they realized that was a dead end. He, that he wasn't interested in ideas, but he was interested in, in um, political symbols or really the experiences behind those symbols as it were. So um, ideas are for Vogel and sort of can be are objects that can be manipulated and constructed and used in ideologies where political symbols are really just a genuine expression of a person or society's participation in reality. Um, and as a sort of order, as a representation of some sort of transcendent truth. So, so by symbol, he doesn't just mean the flag or uh, uh, the capital or something yeah. like that, I suppose. Although maybe the capital would come a little closer. It's become, and it has taken on renewed importance as a symbol in American politics in the last couple of years. Um, consent of the governed, is that a symbol? Is the constitution a symbol? Uh, uh, I, I'm still trying to figure out what's a symbol as opposed yeah, to, no, the, and I, I mean, consent of the governed might be an idea. What about the constitution? Is that a symbol? Uh, uh, representation itself? What? Uh, no, I think that's right. Um, yeah, so I think the for Americans, the constitution would be a, a political symbol. A sim uh, for So a symbol would be, or one type of symbol, say a symbol of representation would be something that has a genuine authority that society subscribes to and believes in. So the constitution would be an example for say Americans or uh, the charters of freedom for Canadians maybe. Things of, so institutions can be symbols, but it gets a little complicated I think with Vogelin because you also have symbols of what, uh, of disorder too. Symbols are sort of in, in, can be in contest, contest with each other on, you know, for legitimacy and authority in society. So it's always, uh, you know, it's, um, and, and we see this say in, in the United States where yes, the constitution gives sort of the, the legitimacy for the federal government, but then we, we have different schools of thought of how to interpret the constitution and what that actually means. So you use that term anthropology or maybe philosophical anthropology. Vogelin talks about that. Is that a part of political science or is it a, a discipline that political scientists really need to know? And, and if so, how does that figure into the study of political life? I mean, is it just psychology or is it something different? Yeah, I, I, so I think throw, throw an anthropological symbol would be, um, is, is, is the case where it's um, say Socrates against, uh, Socrates trial in Athens, for example. So um, the Athenians um, had a certain view of legitimacy and authority that they symbolized in say the old gods. And then Socrates has a, a new type of insight of transcendent truth where he symbolizes in philosophy. And so uh, what in, in the trial of Socrates, you have these two, sim these two political symbols in, in, in contest with each other, trying to struggle with one another to say, what should be the transcendent truth for society? Should it be you know, Socrates inside of the life of reason or should it be the older gods of Athens?
does does every society have a transcendent truth? Is that part of what he means by political order? That uh, every society has a transcendent proof or are, tr uh, truth, or are there political movements or uh, ways of thinking about politics that can do away with transcendence? Uh, you mentioned um, the soteriological right, which has to do with salvation, and I take it that has something to do with tra transcendence. But don't we have I, maybe this is a symbol, separation of church and state, or, or, or in some way or another, we say that's not politics, that's outside of politics. Uh, I, 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 I'll be interested in what other people think in the Q&A, but I, I think for Vogelin, every society does, uh, um, every society has a political symbol. The question is there, whether the political symbol is one of order or disorder. So you have, I mean, Vogelin himself mentions that, for example, the Soviet Union, all right, it, 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 what you would call a, a Gnostic political symbol or symbol of disorder in that, in that way. So um, it seems to me for Vogelin that every society wants to, has to sort of symbolize itself or has to give its own self-interpretation to its people. Um, but whether it's one that's um, rooted in transcendent truth or one that's sort of rooted in a deform deformation of it or a Gnostic version of it uh, will vary from society to society. Is that what political science does is sort out different kinds of order or order from yeah, dis I, I mean, defines order from disorder. I guess sometimes, I mean, I guess sometimes it's self-evident, but other times it isn't, right? You said contest contests about the meaning of the constitution. That's actually part of our order. It's not a sign of disorder, although someone might come from another society and say they argue all the time in, uh, in court, they have no idea what their uh, constitution means. <laughs> that must be disorder. I mean, who sorts that out? How does, what, what, what framework does Vogel give for sorting out the difference between order and disorder or different kinds of order? Yeah, I think it's, 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 in the new science of politics, one of his projects is he's trying to, he states he's trying to uh, basically look at a variety of political symbols and then look at the experiences underneath those political symbols. And what essentially he's trying to do is create a aggregate cl class of experiences to use as a sort of reference points or a database to see which are experiences of, experiences of order and which are experiences of disorder in that way. Now, the question is, um, you know, how you may, somebody may, may say, well, that's just his interpretation. <laughs> Uh, you know, he says this experience A is one of order and experience B is one of disorder. And I think the only answer to that is that we would have to, as other political, as political scientists, as readers, we would have to compare those experiences with our own experiences and see if they comport with each other and see if they match with our understanding of what human nature is. Um, and so that's, that's sort of a way to sort of evaluate whether his analysis of political symbols and the experience behind them are one of order and disorder. Um, we have to basically evaluate it against our own, our own experiences in that way. Um, and in some ways that's unsatisfactory to the modern mind, which wants sort of you know, an airtight answer. Um, but you know, I think in some ways that's probably the nature of the human condition. Does that get you back to that question of objective versus you didn't say what the opposite of objective is. Usually it's subjective, right? So when he's speaking of, of experience, is that a reference to subjectivity or, uh, or what's up? Could I ask, some, someone is not muted now. So if we could, we'll have a Q&A in about 15 minutes, but uh, if you could hold. Anyway, so, so that's my question. Is it the objective or the subjective? And how does this question of experience uh, uh, enter into all of that? I guess one way to think about it is that um, the nature of politics, nature of analyzing human experience and the political symbols that, that are, give rise from them uh, can, never be under, can never be analyzed objectively for Vogelin. Um, having said that, it's not entirely subjective or uh, whatever, whatever one wants to think. There's a middle ground in, in that way between subjectivity and objectivity. Um, so and, experience and that, is shared. Is that is it like intersubjectivity? Is experience intersubjective? Yeah, that's, that's a term some people use. I don't know if he did. Yeah, I don't think he has. But that's probably probably the closest. Yeah, that, that's. I think that's a 
appropriate characterization of what he's trying to do. He's, he's basically appealing to, at least the way I read him, he's appealing to our understanding of what a human being is and looking at the empirical evidence and he's trying to reconstruct those experiences and the symbols that give rise to them. And does, when we look at the evidence, do we come to a similar conclusion or not? When, when he's looking at this sort of classification of different kinds of order, um, he makes a judgment between them, doesn't he? I mean, that is to say, you have the order of Genghis Khan. We have in, uh, a quotation from an extensive quotation from Khan or one of his scribes in uh, the, um, the volume that we've been uh, sort of tracking, the, the uh, Eric Vogel reader we've been tracking in our, um, uh, our, our conversations. Uh, that on the one hand, the Greek and Roman world, the modern constitutional world, the world of uh, Marxism, as you mentioned, and uh, not to mention other fascist totalitarian movements. How does he is how, how does he see these relate to one another? First of all, are they in some kind of historical order? Is there a kind of natural development among them? And uh, and and again, how does he? sort out better or worse, or is it all just in the end a matter of experience? Uh, well, I, I think it's sort of in the early part of his career in ordered history one through three, he, there seems to be a sort of a progression between sort of cosmological, so anthropological to sociological experience in that way. Um, and Later in the 70s, um, with Order in History 4, he seems to sort of back away from that, that progression, as it were. Um, having, so it, I think among Vogelin scholars, there's some um, debate of how to make sense of whether, whether there is sort of a progression or hierarchy of experiences or whether there's some way sort of it's flattened. There, there's um, an interesting essay, it's actually an excerpt that I think from something longer in the reader uh, for the section on politics about the good society. Uh, yeah. Is that a, what does he mean by that? And is that a kind of transhistorical standard that he sets up that allows us to have a reference point to judge different political orders? Is the good society a political society or is it something separate from politics? No, I, I, yeah, I, that's one of my favorite parts of the, of the reader is the good society where, I mean, for Fogelin, the good society is obviously a society that has enough uh, wealth and organization, but more importantly, where the life of reason can sort of penetrate or society or has a social force in society. Um, I've, and that, I think that in some ways can be a standard, uh, standard to evaluate other societies. Um, it sort of raises the question. I mean, I think one of the things I think I find it fascinating about that essay is that he doesn't really um, give a particular political organization for the good society. He says, you know, it could be a polis, it could be a nation state, it could be something else in that way. So there's a flexibility on the, on the form of society. I think more importantly, is there a life of reason uh, as a social force, whatever society, society that is. The, um, the other part of the essay I always find fascinating is, um, Sort of the, the inter civilizational dialogue between the West and Ch China and India, right? He says, in some ways, China and India are a, a cosmological civilization and they haven't been able to um, break free from that. So, how, how do we, how does say the West, which is, has sort of a more rational, um, rationality has penetrated that society, how does it actually able to communicate with a it's a civilization that's cosmological and, and he sort of goes through various options on that. But it's, it's a problem that I think in many ways, it's, it's an essay that's so relevant today, right? How do we, you know, how does the United States communicate with say China or India? Um, and are we talking past each other because of uh, our, the way we see the world our political symbols are just very different. You would say he, he, he thinks we are, you think, or at least that's his implication that we, we tend to, or do societies, again, back to that question, do they move from, or how does society move from a cosmological orientation? Whatever that is, I'm still not sure whether you've defined <laughs> it unless it's where the government pretends to be ruling by divine right, yeah. uh, or because uh, uh, it, it's speaking for the gods or the God or whatever. Um, uh, how do you move from that to this world of 
philosophical anthropology where there's, I take it, well, I don't know, is the rule of reason the rule of debate and exchange, or is it uh, uh, the rule of the rational bureaucrat? I mean, uh, Hegel thought that there was a movement towards a rational society, but its completion is the Reichstag, right? Uh, uh, a fully <laughs> yeah. developed um, administrative state. Is that what Vogel means by rationality, or is there something else going on? Well, in, in the essay, uh on the good society, he, re he refers to the life of reason as really twofold. And so there's pragmatic reason, which sort of deals with science and math and things that are sort of universal across societies and civilizations. And then he, you have what's noetic reason, which is sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, spiritual, spiritual insight into reality. Um, and so I think his point here is that in the West, we have a different spiritual insight into reality. Uh, you know, sociological, whereas um, the spiritual insights of say a civilization like China or India, it's very different. So on a pragmatic level, you know, the West and China and India could probably find, could talk to each other, but noetically, right? Because um, we have different spiritual insights, it, it becomes more difficult in that way. We, we may be end, end up talking past each other in that way. Um, do societies as as, need to share, a, to share a religion then in order to communicate is uh, because uh, and is that what he really means by the cosmological or the uh, even the anthropological? Does it all have to be understood in religious terms? Is, do societies have to be understood in religious terms or at least in, re in reference to their, I don't know, what would it be, their dominant religion or whether they are religion, religious or not, right? I mean, often our society is described as secular today. Is that a healthy society for Vogelin or? Yeah, I mean, certainly religion is, is one of the mainstays where the life of reason emerges, but um, you can also have life of reason doesn't necessarily have to be symbolized through religion. So philosophy is a good example. Uh, and he, he looks at you know, sort of, Plato and Aristotle um, as what a uh, new insight into spiritual reality that pushes back against the, the, the theology of Homer, right? And, and, this, and he, he argues that this is a superior account of um, transcendent truth or spiritual reality than, than sort of the religious forms before. And, and then how does Christianity and Judaism, how do they come into this uh, uh, story? Are they compatible with uh, with philosophy, do they involve a kind of retreat back to cosmology? Are they moving ahead to soteriology, or what? What's going on uh, in relation to um, to social development? Uh, and and then, how does any of this relate? Well, that's my next question. Is going to be about the ideology. So, yeah, so uh, I, thought, really I think. Well, if I mean Christianity, I think for Vogelin is um, is. At least for Vogel, it is compatible with, with philosophy. So, I mean, this is probably one of the big disagreements between Vogel and Strauss, right? It, where Vogel, Strauss sees them separate and Vogel sees them in some ways the same sort of experience, which is accessing different aspects of that. Um, and so, I think for Vogel, the great insight of, of, or spiritual insight of Christianity and Judaism is that. Um, Human beings can become friends with gods. People have sort of an equal spiritual um, destiny uh, in a transcendent realm beyond beyond um, beyond, beyond the earthly realm. Um, and this is really in contrast to say, for example, with Gnosticism or ide ideologies, which, uh, according to Vogelin, is sort of a Gnostics or ideologues want to try to put a really want to in implement a heaven on earth, as it were. Whereas say uh, Judaism and Christianity sees that um, uh, salvation is beyond this world. Wait, so you mean ideology, say fascism or communism, or maybe even liberalism, uh, are not, don't involve the rejection of religion, according to Vogelin, but actually have a kind of religious spirit to them, or, uh, or they, there's something religious about them? Is that what you're you're yes, I, I would say a religious motivation, perhaps, is another way of saying it, um, right? It's, so there's, 
every human being, I think for Vogel, you know, there's a dissatisfaction with the world and we want to try to uh, change it. But for, um, for Christians and, and, and others, they, you know, that, that dissatisfaction will never be resolved on earth. But for an ideologue or agnostic, they, tra they, tr they use that, they translate that dis dissatisfaction with the world and into the belief that human action can change it and actually um, eradicate that evil in the world and, re and remake it. So, so it really has a different, I mean, this, that's, isn't that what politics is? I mean, trying to change the world or uh, uh, develop an order to the world in a certain way, or uh, I mean, so isn't modern politics or is it just modern politics? Is it just uh, ideological all the way down? Or how is it that, that Vogel thinks that can be avoided uh, or what, maybe the better way to say is, what, what do we have to learn? Isn't that our natural way of thinking, governed as we are by positivism or behaviorism or whatever one wishes to call it, by this sort of notion that we can engineer society and something's broken, fix it. You know, that's pragmatism, the pragmatic way of thinking. Isn't that uh, our way of thinking about politics? What else? He wants to introduce something different that we're missing. Well, it's, it's a balancing act, I think, for Vogelin, where, I mean, on the one hand, um, you know, political elites, they have to, they have to balance sort of the expectations of a people and the needs of a people, and also with um, sort of political symbols or self-interpretation of that society as a type of, of order or transcendent truth. And so it is, it is a case of politics that, yes, you do want to fix certain things, um, but it may be the case that politics does not provide you ultimate meaning in that way. And, and those um, perhaps those institutions or organizations that provide ultimate meeting, you know, would fall into what we would call civil civil society, you know, the family unit, the university, the churches, things of that sort. So I, it's not that yeah. I think Vogelin recognizes, you know, for pragmatic reason, yes, the government needs to, to address the needs and expectations of the people, but ultimately, it, it, it can't promise to sort of provide ultimate meeting ultimate meaning for people. Okay, well, we, we've spoken, you and I now for about half an hour and I'd like to uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, if uh, Zoom has a, um, a raise hand feature under reactions and if, uh, if you have a question just indicated in that way and um, I'll call on you and if you could then um, or I'll call on you by whatever your Zoom name is. And uh, at, that, at that point, if you could unmute yourself and uh, ask your question to uh, Dr. Trepanier, that would be great. So the first hand that's gone up is from uh, Sixto Garcia. So please unmute yourself and uh, thank you for uh, your question. Uh, thank you, Professor Trepanier. Um, if I may go back to a distinction Vogelin makes that you alluded to at the beginning of your talk between symbol and idea, that connects me with a distinction made by the Spanish philosopher Ortega y Gasset, Jose Ortega y Gasset, between ideas and beliefs. I mean, you can live or die for a belief. You may not be willing to do so for an idea. My question is, how would that fit within Vergelin political ethics and his sense of rationality, if it does? I think some of that uh, surfacing in his book, uh, Hitler and the Germans. Thank you. Yeah. So, if I understand the question, is how would the uh, is there the parallel between idea and belief to symbol and belief, or symbol and idea? Is that right? Oh, how would the distinction between ideas and belief find a place within Vergolin's uh, political ethics and his uh, okay. notion of rationality? Uh, yeah, I, I, my sense is that ideas are more for Vogelin, Ideas are more, are more susceptible. Ideas are basically objects that can be manipulated and are more amenable to ideologues and Gnostics in that way. So he, he tends to be, a bit sus he recognizes the, the, the utility of ideas, but he tends to be suspicious I think, of it. Um, whereas symbols is really, or symbols of transcendent truth, you can always have Gnostic symbols as well, but symbols of transcendent truth 
are really um, ethical in the sense that they invoke within people a sense of uh, legitimacy and authority and of, of order in that way. Symbols are, are again, are, they emerge, they can't be arbitrarily constructed. They emerge from our, our encounter with reality. And so it raises the question, some people encounter reality for Vogelin in a truncated or deformed way and other people can, for Vogelin encounter reality in its fullness. So I don't know if that answers the question or not. But. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a question now from uh, the Vogelin Institute, uh, uh, the, the students and others grad, uh, gathered there. So uh, uh, let's see who's our questioner and go ahead and speak. Uh, uh, Conrad, Dr. Stunner. Um, so one of the most interesting bits about this, uh, this week's reading is what struck me was on page 75 when Vogelin is talking about the conceptions and the substance of order, like proper, like proper order in a society. Um, the title of the chapter is Necessary Moral Basis for Communication in a Democracy. He says, this is the uh, uh, beginning of the first paragraph on 75. In the classic and Christian conceptions of society, the substance of order is understood to consist in the homonoa um, homo of its members. Uh, men are members of the society insofar as they participate, either in the no, in the classical sense, or in the logos, in the Christian sense. This conception of social order was predominant well into the 17th century. The, um, the main thing that I got from Vogelin talking about um, how to properly orient communication and democracy is people have to be familiar with the kind of notions they're discussing. So constitutionalism, rule of law. Um, so what is that? Um, so every good um, dem uh, democratic peoples know exactly what we're talking about um, in this kind of uh, way. Vogelin later says that there are going to be good and bad orders, as you said earlier, sir. Um, so based on that, um, is there, there needs to be this kind of familiarity with these concepts um, that um, create democratic societies to Vogelin, or is this something that has to develop on its own over time? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, it, it does. Um, so I, I think the key is, um, homonoia or like-mindedness, right? So people have people have a like-mindedness to the regime, as it were, or what we today call civic education, right? So it may be a case where people, um, yes, it, sort of the, our citizens have a conceptual understanding of the constitution, federalism, separation of powers, but it's also important as well that it, it's a lived experience as well, that they're able to participate in civically in, the, in their polity, as it were. And that's what's really crucial for, for a good society. Um, and I, it's, I think it's interesting that you cite that essay, um, The Moral Basis of, communi of Communication, because what that essay is pointing out is that um, he's, sort of, he's criticizing the idea of a pluralism. Like, we're a pluralistic society. Everyone has their own opinion. Isn't this great? And, and he's, no, this is actually, this is, this is terrible. <laughs> If you look historically at the past 450 years, right, it's a pattern of what? Movement, counter movement, war, some sort of temporary peace, and then we, we cycle starts all over again. And he's pointing, the only way to sort of break out of that cycle is if we can have um, some sort of moral basis or some sort of homonoia among all our citizens, or at least a super majority of our citizens that we can agree on as sort of a, a moral, uh, moral reference point then to sort of evaluate various opinions that are given. So um, yeah, no, I mean, so th those are sort of my thoughts on, I, on that. Uh, yes, sir, and sorry, just one more thing. You call so me Lee, you want to call me sir. <laughs> okay, um, the, so is uh, maybe Vogelin saying that maybe we should kind of copy what Homer was advertising in the Iliad, uh, that all of these, uh, these Greeks have this understanding of what is moral, that's why what Achilles is doing is so horrendous. 
as he's dragging the ba body of Hector before Troy. And both sides are like, whoa, you went way too far with this one, Achilles. <laughs> Uh, possibly. Um, I think probably for the American context, probably someone like Toku will probably be a better fit in terms of civil society uh, and, and local association, but I, I get your point. <laughs> the, the next question comes from uh, Benjamin uh, Maybury. Ben? Thank you. Uh, something I wanted to point out and uh, ask a question about. Uh, one of the things that Boglin says in the in the beginning is that the deviation from uh, classical to modern understandings of politics comes from the rejection of ontology and the rejection of philosophical anthropology. And from that, we get all of these ideological religions, communism, fascism, and liberalism. Uh, and when he talks about the rejection of ontology, what I noticed is he keeps coming back to this same pairing of order truth and disorder lies. And so it seems to me here that he's articulating a, an objective reality and ontology that all people share through their common access to reason. And so if he's putting forward this model, and, and, and I'm seeing it in my notes over and over and over again, uh, you know, truth has to conquer lies in order for order to exist. Truth is accessible through the soul. The soul must be reestablished as the center of man. And doesn't this kind of emphasis on an objective truth, even if it's available to everybody, first permit understanding across cultural lines because he's saying a reality exists prior to our ability to access it through reason and does it also though necessarily mean there are certain types of political order and certain types of ideas that are objectively wrong uh not in the sense of the obvious you know killing a lot of people is wrong but these systems of government can't work uh, yes, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, he does believe that ontology ex exists uh, uh, across um, all societies, um, and but how, you know how they're manifested will be different depending on the sort of social and cultural context of that society. So, but there is, there is something that all human beings share is is what Vogelin believes, um, and so yeah, I, I, I think you're exactly right, spot on upon that. There's a um, um, in terms of well, the second part was what, but dis the disorder of society, I, maybe you could that, that there are certain certain concepts, certain ideas, uh, like he gives the example of socialism, he gives the example of societies that reject the soul as being always objectively wrong, period, end of story. Uh, yes, I, th I think that's correct. I think it's a little more complicated because I think he might say it's, it's not so much the symbols that are objectively wrong. Um, I'm, well, they would be, but, but more importantly is, is that the experiences behind those symbols. So um, if one ha has sort of um, an experience or an encounter with reality, that they would say, I want to establish um, some sort of utopia on earth, that can be manifested as Nazism or as a communism. And, and so, uh, yes, he, he does he does see the symbols as sort of objectively wrong, but I think more importantly is are the experiences behind those symbols that are, um, are at the root of it. The next question is from Alejandro Medina. If you could unmute yourself and uh, please ask. should be maybe bottom left of your screen, a little button that uh, you can press to unmute. Here, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm still struggling with uh, this idea of symbols um, that, that uh, Dr. Stoner um, brought up several times. 
I, I'm wondering, just to give one particular example, uh, do you think, for example, that a nation's uh, image of itself, because we're dealing here with images of itself, of uh, self-reflections, right? A nation's image of itself, which may come up once and again in literature, in, uh, in writing, such as, for instance, United States, or more specifically, Israel, of being a messianic nation. Could the Messiah be a symbol in the sense that uh, Ferdinand is talking about? For example, one soteri that would be a soteriological anthropological symbol. There would be others as leader or, uh, I don't know, that the, the, the thing is that this is the one that comes up to my mind right now. Would that be a, an, an instance of a symbol, such a symbol? Uh, yes, I, I think so. I think so. I mean, and, and um, I think the key though for Vogelin is that, say with uh, messiatic, you know, messiatic symbols is that, um, at least for Vogelin, he doesn't think that those the um they will never be fulfilled in temporal reality so um i think in fact in israel revelation which i think we'll talk about later in these sessions you know he, he looks at isaiah as sort of a, a gnostic prophet who, who, who's messianic but who's um um but for all the you know he, he's he's agnostic he's illegitimate he's, he's evoking political symbols but um, ones that are ultimately one of uh, disorder in that way. But yes, it, I, I, I think, I, I, yeah. I, I wasn't so interested in the, the viability of, uh, of, of this being actually accomplished or not, whether they can or cannot be eventually and ultimately messiahs or not, but just the, the, the idea in itself or the, the image in, it, in itself, you know, messiah is a very concrete image. Or I'm thinking, for example, um, I'm thinking uh, right now of, uh, of an image also um, in the 16th century, uh, a, a printed image of Europe that tried to give to a court of each nation uh, a part of the body. And uh, because Spain was uh, predominant at the time, Spain was the crown and head, and then you had France was the torso, and so it went on like that. Uh, so the, obviously there's an image there, a symbol there of being the head. Um, I imagine that would be a kind of a, a political symbol in the sense that Ferguson was talking about. Everybody thought of itself then at the time as belonging to a nation that really sort of uh, led Europe. And, uh, and, and that would be, I'm just trying to figure out exactly what to, uh, to, to, to translate symbol from a very abstract uh, notion to something concrete that we can actually see such symbols. Uh, some, I can, those are two, for example, that I can think of. You know, I, I know that at the beginning he talks about China, for example, seeing itself and Egypt as the center of a universe in a kind of a cosmological circle. Uh, that's also a kind of, a, you know, in, in the way that Dante translates uh, translates the cosmos into this uh, wonderful form, for example. And that is too a political sort of a symbolic uh, journey. No, I, I think that's exactly right. And it's probably worth saying that, um, you know, where political symbols emerge from a variety of sources, it could be philosophers, it could be artists, it could be political leaders uh, for Vogelin. It, you know, there's a lot, Vogelin had a, a wide range of readings um, from, you know, and so where the political symbols emerge from it, it, it's really the person who, person who has that sort of spiritual insight, and then more importantly, it's able to what, persuade people that their 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 insight is correct. So um, I think it's a sort of a concrete example, maybe the European Union, right? It is it is a political symbol, but um, you know, on the one hand. It, what, European elites have bought into it, but the populace hasn't. So it's, it's sort of um, you know, a symbol that's kind of ineffective in, in that way. Um, so that, that may be maybe another example to sort of think about that is sort of, certainly it was created, but it's um, it sort of lacks sort of perhaps social and political authority. I don't know if that answers it. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I, it's, I'm beginning to agree. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question from Thomas Lorden. Thank you. 
Uh, when I first read Vogelin, one of the most striking passages, and it occurs in the New Science of Politics, is uh, the idea that the psyche is the sensorium of the transcendence. Uh, it seemed to me that that's central to his thought generally. Uh, this is the discovery that's made by philosophers and results in the first differentiation in history. Um, it's, uh, and it, it struck me that in using that language, sensorium of the transcendence, Vogland was invoking not just a cognitive aspect of human reason, but an emotional aspect as well. And uh, it, it was striking in part because it was so different from the, the enlightenment view of reason, which just stresses the, the well, exclusively focuses on the calculative and uh, discursive aspect of reason. But it's, it's completely different and, and in fact, contrary to Thomas Aquinas's concept of reason as natural reason, uh, which is a view that uh, the church has. Uh, Vogelin, in fact, criticizes the idea of natural reason in view of reason as the sensorium of the transcendence, he says that there is no such thing as natural reason. Uh, or I suppose you could say that there's natural reason, but that's only a truncated version of the full, fully differentiated Voglinian reason. So I, I just wondered if, um, I, I always thought this was central in, in uh, Voglin's work and radical, you know, not in an ideological sense, perhaps in, in, a, in a sense of a rediscovery. Certainly there are even aspects in Aquinas where reason seems to be not limited to natural reason, but a participation in transcendence, in supernature. And of course, Vogelin thinks that reason as a sensorium of the transcendence is something that's clearly there in Aristotle and Plato, although so many other scholars completely disagree with that. Um, so I wondered if, if, if uh, Lee or, and perhaps Professor Stoner could address the question of how radical uh, was this view, this statement that uh, reason, the psyche is the sensorium of the transcendence, and maybe talk a little bit about its implications um, in Vogelin's work generally. Thank you. That's a great question. Actually, it seems more, more suited for David Walsh. But I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give a stab at it. Um, I, I want, in terms of how radical of an idea it is, I want, it seems to me in some ways it, more in the tradition of um, phenomenology, right? In some, in some sense, in, in that way where it's, it's, um, it's, it's phenomenology and existentialism where it's a sense of what participation in your um, the entire being and not just reason itself. So, um, or his understanding of reason as noetic reason, which is again, broader than what you would find someone like Aquinas. Um, so yeah, and so I guess if that is a radical, certainly from a, from a, a classical perspective or from a, um, Medieval, medieval scholastic perspective, perhaps. Um, I'm, I'm not probably less so from a phenomenological perspective. I think it's probably more, more suited in that way. And that's part of the, the um, intellectual environment that he's, he's in, although he doesn't really talk about it quite a bit, interestingly enough, um, in the autobiographical reflections. Um, in terms of the consequences of that, it, it seems to suggest that this idea of, of as what do you call pragmatic reason or rationality, um, is, is not, it's not fulfilling for, or not persuasive to um, the populace. I think in, in many ways, whether, what, what, whatever one may fall on the, on the, on the handling of say COVID in the United States, um, you know, it's just not enough to say, this is what the science tells you, or this is what the expertise tells you, that people are, need to be persuaded um, with, ration, with reason plus something else beyond that. So I, I don't know if that's, well, it's, maybe it's open a can of worms, I don't know. 
<laughs> his use of the concept is especially interesting because, uh, of course, uh, especially in Anamnesis, he refers not only to reason as man's search for God, but as the locus of God's search for man. And so revelation in that sense, it, 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 as a Christian, I usually think of revelation as what you read in the Bible. In Vogelin, revelation, at least in part, and, and what he stresses seems to be that experience, you know, and, and the, the metaxi, which of course is also this sense of reason as the sensorium of the transcendence. Um, in any way, thank you. Yeah, it, it is, I think, the participation of all of being in that way, yeah, but you know, I, mean, I think you, you know, that's a, it's a great passage and worthy, thank you for pointing that out to the group. We have a question in the, in the chat that uh, uh, I'll invite the questioner to uh, follow up on if he wishes, but I'm going to go ahead and read it. Uh, for now. This was from uh, Stephen Strom, and he says, what do you think Vogel would say about how strictly we should follow the Constitution, uh, given what we're seeing in the U.S. today, the passage of laws undermining an egalitarian society, he alleges. Uh, are we not seeing a prelude to a totalitarian state, the very reason that Vogel fled Austria for the U.S.? Um, uh, for sure, our life today feels headed to more chaos than towards order. Well, he says for sure, but then there's a question mark. So I'm not quite sure uh, uh, where he is on that. But uh, but but what do you think? How um, and maybe to generalize from this, what do we get from Vogel to speak to our political situation today? Does is there anything he has to speak to to, to say to it that you're willing to uh, to sort of suggest that um, that, <laughs> that he might, we might be able to take some guidance from it, or is he operating on this level? Uh, of, of sitting back in the armchair and uh, sort of contemplating the whole of history or uh, the possibilities of transcendence and leaving politics, most of politics or some of politics in any event to those who are going to uh, fight it out in their um, limited ways. Trying to get me canceled, are you? So, <laughs> um. I think there's probably a few ways to approach that uh, question. I think one is with the, what you said earlier, actually, about the Constitution, our debate about oh, what the Constitution means in many ways, <laughs> it, it suggests that um, really that we're probably healthier as, as a society than sometimes we think. But um, the essay, I think, of the, of the readings that we, we did today is the communication, the moral basis of Moral, the need for a moral basis for communication is, is probably the best one to use to sort of analyze our, our political discourse, right? Where we really just, we are not just, um, we're not even, even talking past each other. We're just talking to ourselves. You know, one camp is talking, conservatives are talking to conservatives and liberals are talking to liberals just to rally their, their bases in that way. And there's no agreement between the two camps, between the polarization of opinion, because we can't, we, we don't share uh, a life of reason. We don't have that sort of common civic education, which I talked about earlier, or homonoia, or as um, if John Van Hyken's written a lot about, we don't have friendship among our citizens. And, and, and that's, um, that's why we can't talk to each other. And politics fundamentally is how, how can we, politics is, is basically speech and how can we persuade one, one another. So this is, um, so I think that essay is really crucial analyzing sort of the contemporary politics and discourse today. Um, having said that, I think there's, you know, I think there's some, a, a number of political scientists and other scholars that have recognized this. You see a, a big move for civic education. This is one of the projects I'm working on here in Alabama. Um, you have even at universities in the United States where they have, um, I think, civil, civil, civil dialogue clubs, right, where they put people from different camps and to deliberately debate with each other. So there is, um, even now, there, even though things seem, seems a bit sort of depressing, there, there is a recognition among some people to, that this is a problem and they're trying to find remedies to address it. Good. Uh, do we have any more questions? There, uh, there's someone else mentioned the communication uh, in the chat, the communication uh, essay as well. You know, one, um, here, I see a question's come in from Joshua Kennedy. So please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes, I was wondering 
for um for a totalitarianism might be seen as an extreme form of order on one level, but does Vogelin actually see that as a, a form of disorder? Uh, yeah, so you would see totalitarianism as a form of um, disorder. So, I, I mean, on the one hand, it does seem to function for a while um, pragmatically, so from a pragmatic view of life of reason, but noetically from the life of reason, it's a denial of certain ontological realities. And that's why it, he thinks ultimately it will fail. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Stuart Bailey. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is a little bit like the um, question just previous, but I wanted to put a little um, maybe finer point or simpler question. <clears throat> you mentioned early on that Vogelin embarks on the project of a new science of politics based on his formative experiences of social order and disorder and trying to kind of make meaning of those experiences. Um, he publishes, as you mentioned, the kind of outline of his diagnostic in a new science of politics in 1952 um, <clears throat> through the lens. So again, not trying to get anybody <laughs> canceled <clears throat> through the lens of Vogelin and and his, you know, the diagnostic kind of outlined in the new science of politics and maybe kind of elaborated on in later works. Um, would you say that Vogelin himself, if he were alive today in that framework, would say our global social um, or you know, our global society is um, more ordered or more or more disordered? Uh, you know, what's the arc of ordering or disordering globally um, uh, relative to 1952 or even 1930? Right. No, I think that's a great. I mean, it really leads to that. At least the, the last essay in the reader for the reading, with, where, where he talks about world empire, right? Where he, he and he see, so he, um, where for you know Vogelin, there, an empire is really there's two components. There's a pragmatic component of sort of territory and organizations, but there's also uh, sort of the world part, the spiritual part of an empire, in, in that way. And so, um, and I think it's an interesting essay because at the end, end of the essay, he argues that really there's going to be no sort of um, the age of empire is over because, you know, all of humanity is, is sort of will be in the transcendent realm of uh, that Christianity promises. So there's no there's no sort of pragmatic order that can represents the, sort of the universal humanity. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to see whether that's I wonder how well that proposition holds today, right? So some people would say, you know, the globalization or technology or the um, Kozhev's homogeneous, universal homogeneous state um, may, may, may be a contrary response to Vogelin's prediction. So I, I think there's, um, um, it, it, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I really haven't thought it through specifically for today's environment, but um, that that's, I think some of the implications implications you can draw from that, that essay would be very fruitful. And, and I'm Thank glad you. you mentioned that essay because uh, I enjoyed it enormously when I, I read it, but, but see if I'm understanding something correctly here. When Vogelin talks about order, he in a way starts from the premise that coercion does not create order. I mean, in yes. other words, when Vogelin is talking about order, it has to be created in some other way than by coercion. And that that's, that's sort of the idiot mistake that most people make <laughs> in thinking about <laughs> politics, that order comes from a sword. And, and Vogelin's argument in this whole progress of societies, the whole struggle is that order doesn't come from a sword. Uh, Blood comes from a sword, and it's just uh, uh, it's it's just sword against sword, and that a principle of order is the alternative to coercion. So that the Gnostic ideas that coercion slash the tires is our latest version of it, right, uh, to cross our northern border. Uh, uh, that 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 this is not creating order. This is the alternative to order and a, a promise of disorder. Am I right about that? Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think the other interesting thing about the essay is that, or the implication of that is that you know, with empire, you can have. 
I mean, it, it is a different type of political form that he, he's analyzing, right? Um, compared to the nation state or the polis. And so you know, he sees sort of, um, you know, empire by itself sort of is what uh, diverse and allows different parts to exist, right? The life of reason can exist in an empire, whereas the life of reason couldn't exist in a totalitarian state, right? Because there's emp empires are not homogeneous as, as a totalitarian state. So there's a lot of, yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting things that you can draw out from that essay. Um, and, and dealing with questions of sort of um, globalization and cosmopolitanism today. We, we have just a little more time and I see two last questions. So the first would come from the Vogel Institute again. Um, so Charlie, if you'll unmute and uh, let's uh, present our question. Oh, oh, hi, hello. Uh, I'm uh, Alec Warren. I'm Jim's colleague here. Uh, I found the essay on uh, World Empire it was quite fascinating. I liked the beginning a lot. At the end, I felt sort of spun out of control. It began to make sweeping claims in, in very intemperate language, uh, which left me underwhelmed. I mean, first of all, he attacks a fairly obscure, at least I've never heard of them, figure named Turgot from the, I guess, French Enlightenment. Um, and he thinks that there's some very clear, direct path from a, he's still a soft to a dangerous maniac, the apocalyptic concentration camps, uh, Gnostics, the religion of calm, social terrorism, the, the, the number of, uh, of sweeping formulations uh, builds up. I, what he's saying, of course, is something we've all sort of heard that your progress eventually falters. I guess it leads to, uh, to desperate attempts to realize it, which you know, culminate in fanaticism. Um, I don't think that's I mean, so original. I mean, the way he phrases it, though, it makes him seem uh, to me anyway, as if he might have uh, overreacted to the atrocities of the mid 20th century and you know, in a way which you know, causes him to make you know, sweeping attacks that perhaps aren't justified. I, I agree with you. I think there is some, um, and granted, um, you certainly make some claims at the end of the essay, which are um, sort of probably deserve scrutiny. But um, in fairness to him, he does some of that, that work of trying to link them together, whether you agree or disagree with his other works. He, he is referencing that. Um, but I, I, I do think yeah, the end of the essay is sort of interesting in terms of, because you can, it generates a lot of sort of um, uh, testable hypotheses, which you could sort of see whether they still work today or not. So, um, but I agree with you. There, there, it, in some ways, the, the beginning part of the essay is probably sort of more, um, more on safer grounds than towards the end. <laughs> Last question, uh, back to Ben Mabry. So uh, we've been talking about Vogelin's notion of this ascent, but then uh, I'm looking at my notes at the end of book of chapter four here, and he then seems to follow in Plato's pattern in the Republic and then provide us also a descent from the heights of uh, awareness down to uh, lower, what he calls lower levels of awareness uh, of man's nature and experience. And so he talks about uh, the Gnostic regime and its turn to intellectual, emotional, and volitional Gnosticism. If you think it, if you feel it, if you uh, do it, it will happen. So is this pattern of ascent and then descent, which we use to call Plato a, a political pessimist, also valid in interpreting Vogelin. Is Vogelin a political pessimist here who shows this inevitable decline at the end of the good state in the same way Plato shows the inevitable decline of the Callipolis? Yeah, I, I, think, I think you probably have um, different answers from different Vogelinian scholars on that question. Um, I, I'll just give you my, my sort of 
my sense of it, which is that um, he certainly is a critic of modernity. Um, he, he does think something's lost in the modern world and, and, and you see the rise of Gnostic ideologies um, from that. But um, I don't know if he, but I, I don't, know, don't know if he's a pessimist per se. I think the future is always unknown. And so um, the future may be, be, may be an ascent again or, or not. So um, I know, um, yeah, so the, I guess that'd be my, 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 um, my take on it. It's, uh, he's probably, um, he certainly has some problems or concerns of, of the modern world, but on the other hand, there's, um, there's also good things about the modern world and, and we can also be hopeful as well. But I mean, other other if you ask other Vogel scholars, they'd probably give you different answers too. Well, thank thank you, Lee. I've just uh, created a poll for fun. Uh, well, since we have Vogel scholars, is Vogel a political pessimist or not? So, as we wrap up, uh, uh, have fun with the poll if you want to. We've got a few people coming in, so. Uh, Having fun with Zoom, I hadn't anticipated it, but what the heck, let's give it a try. Lee, I wanna, uh, or Dr. Trepania, I wanna thank you very much for uh, guiding this, uh, this very interesting discussion of Vogel's politics. Uh, thank all of you for joining us and to uh, welcome you to come back next week, a week from now when um, Carol Browning Cooper will uh, speak about Vogel on the divine ground and we'll get to those, uh, those sort of fundamental questions. Uh, on Vogelin's modern philosophizing. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and the poll 